Chapter 4.3 How to Detect If Something is Real We suffer more often in imagination than in reality. Lucius Aeneas Seneca, Reference 75 Chapter 4.3.1 Sapiens Struggle to Detect What's Real There are dedicated fields of knowledge like psychology, phenomenology, and metaphysics devoted to the subject of understanding what real means. It turns out, real is a surprisingly difficult thing for sapiens to define because, as demonstrated in the previous example, our objective sensory inputs are tainted by the subjective, abstract thoughts and interpretations of our big, fat, overpowered, hyperactive, and overclocked brains. Sapiens are effectively trapped behind a neocortical cage. Unable to interpret the world objectively for what it is without skewing it with imaginary meaning and symbolism. This makes it exceptionally difficult to know what real is. Therefore, for the sake of producing a simple argument, this thesis uses the word real as a synonym for physical and the terms imaginary or abstract as synonyms for non-physical. The author acknowledges that what we call physics is technically an experimental process me mediated by the brain's abstractions and therefore not mutually exclusive to or divisible from abstract thoughts. However, for lack of better words to describe ontologically precedent, exogenous and distinct phenomenon like time, mass, space, and energy, which predate sapiens by nearly 14 billion years. This is how the author will use the term real throughout the remainder of this thesis. Real things, according to the author, are categorized as things which produce their own physical signature in the domain of shared objective physical reality, as best as we currently understand what that means. On the contrary, imaginary things can be categorized as things which aren't real and therefore don't produce their own physical signature in the domain of shared objective physical reality. The author understands that the subject matter experts in the fields of knowledge devoted to studying what real means don't make this same non-physical versus physical distinction. He apologizes in advance to professional philosophers for an engineer's bias towards physics and asks for temporary indulgence for the sake of illustrating a point. A human, a human brain's advanced bidirectional and dual use abstract processing is done automatically and subconsciously without requiring control inputs from a human host. Imaginary patterns are produced up front, then cross-reference with sensory inputs received from shared objective reality to determine if a given pattern is real or unreal. This process, this process in logic can be modeled in figure 36 below. Figure 36, model of a realness verification algorithm performed by sapient brains. Reference 76 and 77. Because of the physical constraints associated with receiving sensory inputs, namely the fact that a human can't be everywhere and see, smell, touch, taste, and hear everything all the time, it's far easier for the brain to produce imaginary patterns than it is for the brain to physically verify them by cross-referencing them with the body's sensory inputs. The former only requires imaginary or symbolically gained knowledge, e.g. knowledge gained from activities like thinking or reading or looking at a computer screen, whereas the latter requires exper experiential knowledge, e.g. knowledge gained by collecting physical signals through the body's sensory organs. This is an important distinction to make because it, it means a strong majority of what humans think they know hasn't been physically verified or cross-referenced by their own sensory organs. Additionally, this algorithm is fully automated and subconscious, so sapiens are often not even aware of the fact they do it. In other words, most of what sapiens know about the world is derived completely from symbolism and the imagination, not from what they can directly physically experience through their senses. And they commonly don't realize 
there's even a difference between these two different types of knowledge. Most people get their information about the world from interpretations presented on TV screens or computer screens, i.e. symbolic knowledge, rather than from actually experiencing the world firsthand, i.e. Exper experiential knowledge. Note how the term firsthand implies that information gained or learned directly must directly come from physical sensory organs like hands. So much of what sapiens experience is imaginary compared to what they can physically validate using sensory inputs, that they simply forget the fact that much of what they believe is physically unverified. This would explain why it's so easy for sapiens to be psychologically manipulated. It's easy to lose sight of the difference between objective reality and abstract reality without devoting a non-trivial amount of brain power towards understanding metacognition. It should therefore come as no surprise that sapient brains produce a lot of false positive beliefs about objective reality, which go completely undetected. Can you detect yours? Okay. The way sapiens think appears to be a highly effective survival tactic. Humans may be trapped behind a cage of symbolism from which they can't escape, but the disadvantages of being stuck behind a prefrontal cortex where no conscious distinction is made between real, aka physical, and imaginary, i.e. non-physical, things is offset by the major advantages of abstract thinking. One advantage of abstract thinking is that it helps people with advanced pattern finding and detecting threats. As an example, consider a, humans walking, consider a human walking through the woods. If the eyes detect some sticks, the sapient brain can utilize its advanced pattern finding and abstract thinking skills to produce an imaginary image of a snake. Because the imaginary image of a snake can be cross-referenced to a visual input of sticks gained from physical reality. The brain can produce a forced correlation about realness, as illustrated in figure 37. Unaware of the fact that the snake isn't real, the brain host will take quick and decisive maneuvers to avoid what could be a serious threat. And you see the snake in the brain and the sticks on the ground. Figure 37, false po positive correlation produced by the brain's realness verification algorithm. References 67, 68, and 69. I mean 76, 78, and 79. This example illustrates a scenario where the brain's realness verification algorithm produced a false positive correlation. It turns out false positive correlations about the realness of imaginary patterns are useful in a dangerous world filled with predators because it results in a tendency to err on the side of caution. It's better for survival to produce false positive beliefs about the realness of a threat than to fail to detect a true threat. Because of this instinctive programming, even when sapiens are mega metacognitively aware of the fact that they can't verify what they're experiencing is something physically real, they will still weigh highly or even more important than what their sensory inputs can physically verify. Reference 68. Likewise, even when sapiens are metacognitively aware of the fact that the source of the sensory input isn't the same as the abstract input, they will still falsely correlate it. This is one of the reasons why it's so easy to scare people using fictional stories like horror movies. Even when we consciously know that the threat isn't real because it's on a movie screen, we can still feel afraid about what we witness for days after watching a scary movie. This phenomenon also explains why large populations are quick to believe that high-ranking people, e.g. monarchs, presidents, etc., are powerful people. We forcefully correlate the abstract or symbolic power exercised by a king to the real or physical power exercised by the king's army. Much more on this in the following sections. The bottom line is, it's simply more efficient and easier on the brain to assume imaginary things are real because it saves a substantial amount of energy-intensive thinking power, and because it results in false positive correlations which are beneficial for survival. Reference 68. Recalling the lesson on survivorship bias from Chapter 4, it is reasonable to believe there were plenty of early brains which weren't as instinctively inclined to favor abstract inputs over sensory inputs 
or are quick to produce false positive beliefs about the realness of imaginary patterns. However, their resultant lack of producing false positive beliefs would have made their hosts more complacent, less cautious, and less responsive to genuine threats. In other words, they were less likely to survive. Therefore, the reason why humans constantly struggle to distinguish between imaginary things versus real things could simply be explained by natural selection. The tendency to believe in imaginary things leads to a higher probability of surviving real threats and consequently passing on one's genes. Fast forward over hundreds of thousands of years, and here we are today, routinely making false positive correlations between real and imaginary things, because that's what survives. Sapiens have so much thinking power and are so inclined to believe imaginary things are real that they behave unlike any other animal on Earth. They strongly and passionately believe in things they have never seen, smelled, heard, tasted, or touched. They act, react, and show extreme favoritism towards symbols and operate either oblivious to or consciously unconcerned with the difference between abstract things and physical things. They will respond to stimuli which exist nowhere except within their imagination. More often and far more passionately than information received by their sensory inputs from physically objective reality. They will ignore their experiential knowledge altogether and act strictly according to symbolic knowledge, often not even aware of the fact that they're doing it. They will stop paying attention to the fact that they're sitting down and doing practically nothing because they are entranced in an abstract world spoken or written into existence by a stranger using a complex written language. If you're reading this book, look around for a second and realize that you're just sitting still doing nothing but staring at symbols. Sapiens, unlike any other animal, can and will subject themselves to a great deal of struggle, suffering, and personal sacrifice for reasons which do not exist anywhere except within their collective imaginations. They will adopt belief systems and participate in population-scale consensual hallucination. hallucinations. <laughs> Grateful for the opportunity to labor their entire lives over imaginary things and even die to die for them. This is a defining feature of the human experience. Chapter 4.3.2 Proof of power is proof of real. Pinch me because I must be dreaming. Origin unknown. We have now established that sapient neocortices are so effortlessly skilled at abstract thinking that sapiens struggle to know what is what real is, and thanks to natural selection, they constantly make false positive correlations between imaginary things and real things. Because of this, humans need workarounds or protocols they can use to help them distinguish between imaginary things and real things. For situations where sapiens struggle to distinguish between real and imaginary and desire to know if what they are experiencing is real, many subscribe to an adaptation of the realness ver verification protocol illustrated in figure 38. Whenever sapiens wonder or doubt if an object is physically real or not, the commonly accepted protocol is to attempt to manually generate the physical sensory inputs needed to cross-reference the brain's abstract input with a physical sensory input. A very common way of doing this is by poking or pinching something to generate hepatic feedback for their touch sensory organ. Figure 38, the poking, pinching, realness verification protocol, reference 7677. Abstract input ah, from the brain, got it. Cross reference inputs. Okay. It's a simple and effective protocol. Not sure if an object is real? Try poking it. Not sure if an experience is real? Try pinching yourself. Pinching is especially useful during special occasions where the neocortex is busy producing very convincing imaginary patterns. But the host is deprived of the physical sensory inputs from objective physical reality it needs to cross-reference inputs and attempt to validate realness. 
This often happens when a human is sleeping or when operating in a dreamlike environment like cyberspace. Hence why hepatic feedback systems are popular, such as vibrating video game controllers. Note how the act of poking or pinching something involves the application of force to displace mass. If the object is real, then a human knows from experience and from Reed and Newton that an equal and opposite force will displace the mass of their hand. Likewise, if the event is real, then the force used to pinch the skin will cause the neuroreceptors to detect the displacement. What the brain is doing in these situations is manually generating the sensory inputs needed to cross-reference its abstract thoughts with physical sensory inputs to help make it easier to decide if an object or event is real. Here, the reader should note how this protocol requires physical power to work. What's another name for the displacement of mass with force? Power. Therefore, what's another name for the act of using power to prove that something is real? Proof of power. When a human pokes or pinches something, they apply a force to a mass over time and displace it across space. In other words, they are projecting physical power. Why is projecting power in this way useful? Because power is compromised of the concrete phenomenon of object physical reality, energy, mass, time, and space. It is impossible to kinetically project power without these phenomena. So a proof of power protocol like poking or pinching doubles as a one-stop objective reality verification shop for the sapient brain. If a human can generate proof of power, then they can take comfort in knowing that the concrete phenomenon of shared objective reality, energy, mass, time, space, are present and accounted for within the context of what they're experiencing, helping their mind reach a quicker conclusion about what's real. The purpose of this section is to illustrate yet another reason why physical power is useful and to demonstrate yet another application for the proof of power protocol. Not only is proof of power necessary for survival and helpful for wild animals seeking to establish dominance hierarchies, it's also essential for helping sapiens, creatures who are trapped behind their abstract thoughts, determine what is and isn't real. Not only is proof of power necessary for survival and helpful for wild animals seeking to establish dominance hierarchies, it's also essential for helping sapiens, creatures who are trapped behind their abstract thoughts, determine what is and isn't real. When we factor in sapient metacognition and the processes our brains use to cross-reference abstract thoughts with sensory inputs, we can see that proof of power doubles as proof of physical reality. Without the ability to detect the presence of physical power using protocols like poking or pinching, it's much harder for people to be confident that what they're experiencing is real or not. Trapped in an inescapable and imaginary world behind their eyes and continuously spammed by abstract thoughts produced by an overpowered, oversized, and overclocked neocortex, proof of power serves as a reliable signal for the human brain to identify what is physically and objectively real in an otherwise imaginary world. Physical power is like the North Star for our brains. It helps us navigate across an ocean of imaginary thoughts to get what's true, to get to what's true. Without being able to manually generate a physical power signal, For the purpose of cross-referencing abstract thoughts with sensory inputs, a human cannot verify if what they see and hear physically exists, or if it is just another one of a countless series of abstract beliefs produced by their hyperactive imagination. Imprisoned in our own abstract thinking, physical power is a lifeline. Imprisoned by our own abstract thinking, physical power is a lifeline. We almost desperately rely on physical power signals to know what's real. I don't, that's what it says. I don't know. What does this have to do with Bitcoin? The bottom line up front is that cyberspace is an imaginary reality 
virtual reality is by definition not physical reality. Cyberspace is nothing but abstract symbolic meaning applied to the combined state space of all the state mechanisms connected to each other via internet. Operating online is akin to being in a dream state. It's a shared abstract medium through which people in physical reality communicate. But until the invention of proof of work protocols like Bitcoin, cyberspace was missing something. An open source, decentralized proof of power protocol. People who operate in, from, and through cyberspace have no way to cross-reference the imaginary things they experience online with a genuine proof of power signal that they can use to validate it, if, validate if something is real or not. As will be discussed in the next chapter, Bitcoin appears to fix this by creating a proof of power signal to serve as proof of real signal.